Hi, Rite friends. Welcome to Classics in Color, your weekly dive into some of the ancient world's wackiest facts. I'm Mark Graves, and today we're going to be dipping our toes into the topic of aquaculture and quote-unquote aquariums in the ancient world. My sources for this video are a book entitled The Oxford Handbook of Engineering and Technology in the Classical World by John Olson. It's a magnificent piece of scholarship. It's exhaustive. It's very helpful. Wouldn't necessarily recommend it for light reading, but definitely check it out if you're interested. And then also in this video, I'm going to be citing quite a bit from Columella. He's an ancient Roman author, so from the first century AD, and he wrote De Re Rustica, which more or less means about the countryside, and it's essentially a manual that walks you through different agricultural processes in the ancient Roman world. Romans and Mediterranean people in general are obviously very adept at fishing, and the Romans had all kinds of technologies that they used to harvest fish from wild water. So they had all different kinds of nets and hooks and lines, and it's very impressive and a topic on its own, but in this video, we're mostly focusing on aqua culture, more or less. <laughs> and this was also something that was very important to the Romans and that they used regularly and that they had developed all kinds of cool and complex technologies for, and allegedly they were using these from the very founding of Rome. So we're going to take a look at a quote from Columella about Romulus, who was, of course, the founder of Rome. They, Romulus and Numa, therefore not only stocked the fish ponds which they had themselves constructed, but also filled the lakes which nature had formed, with fish spawn brought from the sea. Hence the Veline and Sabatine lakes, also the Volsiniac and Kiminiad lakes produced bass and gilthead, and all the fishes to be found anywhere which can live in fresh water. Then an age followed which abandoned this method of keeping fish, and the extravagance of the wealthy enclosed the very seas and Neptune himself. The beginning of that passage is obviously talking about early Roman nobles either stocking pre-existing ponds or maybe digging out a whole new one and then stocking that. But what Columella is getting at in the end of the passage is that this technology developed and Romans started to try to build enclosures that either incorporated and or mimicked the ocean and therefore could harbor fish that require saltwater conditions. And you can tell that maybe he feels some type of way about this technology, that maybe it's not a good thing that we're enclosing Neptune and that sort of off feeling was pretty common among Romans. They felt that this technology was maybe a little hubristic. It was certainly luxurious, right? Maybe a little too indulgent. It certainly required way more resources to build and maintain saltwater enclosures than it took to just have a little guppy pond. But that general hesitation was not strong enough to prevent everybody from building these. And next we're gonna take a look at a quote from Pliny the Elder that describes the person who allegedly built the first one. In the same period, the elder Licinius Marina invented fish ponds for all the other sorts of fish. And his example was subsequently followed by the celebrated record of Philip and Hortensius. The Coolis had built a channel that cost more than a country house by actually cutting through a mountain near Naples and letting in the sea. This was why Pompey the Great used to call him Xerxes in Roman dress. After his decease, the fish from this pond sold for four million sesterces. Four million sesterces, according to the Google search that I literally just did, is roughly, maybe, I don't know, two million dollars. So that's a lot of money. And clearly this is a rich person kind of flex. And apparently this became a bit of a fashion for Roman nobles to keep these exotic saltwater fish as pets or just as trophies. And so we're going to look at the very next paragraph from Pliny to see some rich people doing some very rich people things. The first person to devise a separate pond for mores was Gaius Herius, who added to the triumphal banquets of Caesar mores to the number of 6,000 as a loan because he would not exchange them for money or for any other commodity. His less than moderate country estate was sold by its fish ponds for 4 million sesterces as well. 
Subsequently, affection for individual fishes came into fashion. At Baculu in the Baiae district, the pleader Hortensius had a fish pond containing a moray which he fell so deeply in love with that he is believed to have wept when it expired. At the same country house, Drusus's wife Antonia adorned his favorite moray with earrings, and its reputation made some people extremely eager to visit Baculo. I'm just going to add that I would like to see that as well. I think that would be awesome if we could still go visit that sort of private aquarium. But we also have the remains of Tiberius's grotto, which is very beautiful, very impressive. But it seems that this fashion also extended on a smaller scale to the middle class. Because if you look at Pompeii and Herculaneum, we have over 70 examples of different ponds and pools and garden water features of various kinds in different houses that seem to have been used to keep fish. So we're going to look at a passage from Marshall that seems to be describing that fashion. The lion does not seek its prey in the far off sea, but the fish, watched from above, draws the string tossed from a bed or a couch. Should Nereus feel the realm of Iolus, the table, secure in its own store, laughs at storms. A fish pond feeds turbot and homebred bass, the dainty eel swims to its master, the nomenclator summons a familiar gurnard, and aged mullets come forward to order. So it seems like an important part of this fashion was being able to pull fish directly from this pond and be able to cook it up and serve it to your guests as a neat little flex. And I have to say, I am kind of impressed, especially when it came to the salt water enclosures, because it not only took a lot of money, but also a lot of technology. So what we're going to do for the rest of this video is look at some more quotes from Columella that go into the nitty gritty, the details of how these things actually functioned. So the first quote we're going to look at has to do with the problem of circulation because you want to keep the water moving. We consider that incomparably the best pond is one which is so situated that the incoming tide of the sea expels the water of the previous tide and does not allow any stale water to remain within the enclosure. For a pond most resembles the open sea if it is stirred by the winds and its waters constantly renewed and it cannot become warm because it keeps rolling up a wave of cold water from the bottom to the uppermost part. The next passage builds on top of that by talking about how you need to drain off that warm old water that comes to the top and spills off, but it also talks about how you need to be aware of the different varieties because not all of them combine very well, they don't all get along, so you need to be very mindful and strategic about that. Some people, however, hold that Murrays should not be mixed with fishes of another kind, because if they are seized with madness, which sometimes happens to this sort of fish, just as it happens to dogs, they very often pursue their scaly companions and chew them up and devour great numbers of them. If the nature of the ground permits, channels should be provided for the water on every side of the fish pond, for the old water is more easily carried away if there is an outlet on the side opposite to that from which the wave forces its way in. Last but not least, we're going to look at how you need to put lots of little houses and hidey holes in your pond so that fish have somewhere to retreat. The pond is either hewn in the rock, which only rarely occurs, or built of plaster on the shore. But in whatever way it is constructed, if it is kept cold by the swirl of water, which is constantly flowing in, it ought to contain recesses near the bottom, some of them simple and straight, to which the scaly flocks may retire, others twisted into a spiral and not too wide, in which the murrays may lurk. I had so much fun making this video because lately I've been going down a bit of a rabbit hole on YouTube watching all these videos about people building different kinds of ponds and building mini ponds that you can keep on your deck or in your house. And for the next like month, I think I'm going to be like feverishly trying to plan out what kind of pond I'm going to build. And my husband just has to like patiently wait for me to come to my senses. But I had so much fun with this video. So I hope that you had fun as well. Special thank you as always to subscribers and to Patreon members. And I hope to see all of you again next week. Kyrie time.